Different people believe about the church. A central topic in the New Testament is the church. All Christians believe something about it, but what? People have a wide variety of views. Some people think that the church is extremely important because they think the church saves them. Then there are some who don't think the church is important at all and will let you know that as far as they're concerned, if a person has been saved by Jesus, he doesn't need to be a part of any religious group. Still others believe that anyone who professes Christianity should be a part of some denomination. But then they quickly let you know that they don't think it matters which denomination a person joins. According to them, all denominations have their good points. They're all trying to go to the same place. And so they're equally legitimate and equivalent to the church of the New Testament. Some believe that a person is added to the Lord's church when he is baptized and that Jesus died to save all who are a part of his body. So what's the truth about the church? All those different opinions can't be right. I believe the church is essential because it plays a significant role in God's plan of redemption. Why, why is that important? Well, because of what the Bible teaches. What do we learn about the church when we look at the Bible? The church was in the plan of God from eternity. In Ephesians chapter 3, 8 through 11, Paul said, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. That goes through verse 11. Think about that term, the manifold wisdom of God, and how Paul said it is now made known through the church. And this revelation happens in accordance with the eternal purpose of God. In other words, the church was part of God's eternal purpose and plan. The church was spoken of in New Testament or Old Testament prophecy, rather, when Isaiah predicted that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord would be established in Isaiah 2:2. 2, 2. He was predicting the establishment of the church. And then Daniel predicted that during the days of the Roman kings, God would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed in Daniel 2.44. He was foreseeing the coming of the church. The Jews misunderstood these prophecies. They thought and taught that the prophets were speaking of the establishment of a, a worldly material kingdom ruled by an earthly messiah. But Jesus made it clear that he came to build the church as a kingdom which is not of this world. In John 18, 36. His establishment of that church was in line with God's purpose. Consequently, the church is not, as some believe, an afterthought in God's design. A substitute for the physical kingdom. He had intended to institute, uh, they think, they say, they believe established because the Jews rejected Jesus as king. Those who see the church as unimportant, whether they know it or not, are actually questioning the wisdom of, wisdom of God, which included the church in his will. The church, secondly, can be pictured in several different ways. Among the words that are used to describe the church are uh, the church, an assembly, a congregation, a group of people who have been called out for a special purpose in Acts 4.32 and Acts 5.11. It was called a kingdom after Jesus announced, I will build my church. He then told Peter that he would give him the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 16.18 and 19. 
He used the terms church and kingdom interchangeably, and they refer to the same thing. It was described as a household or a family in 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul said that he wrote to Timothy so that he would know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And it was described as a body. Paul spoke of the church, which is his, that's Christ's body, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, 18. It was called, a beautiful term, the bride of Christ. The relationship between Christ and the church is compared to the relationship between a husband and his wife in Ephesians 5, 23 through 31, and in Romans 7, verse 4. What do these differences describe to you? What do they tell you? One, it says that Christ has authority over the church, for he is the king of the kingdom and the head of the body. Second, Christ has a close relationship with his disciples. Christians are as closely related to Christ as the individual members of the human body are to the head of that body. A third lesson that it teaches us is that a close relationship is shared between individual members of a congregation, of a church. They are as close as, to one another as brothers and sisters in a family, as close as the individual members of a human body, such as an arm and a hand. Church members are fellow participants in worship, united in an assembly. Another lesson we learn is that the church is both universal and local. Jesus said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And in this passage, Jesus was speaking of the universal church, the one worldwide kingdom of God. But in Romans 16, 16, Paul spoke of churches of Christ, referring to individual congregations of that universal church. Seven churches in Asia are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, and references to the churches of Galatia appears in Galatians 1 and 2 and 1 Corinthians 16, 1. The word church is also applied to the assembly of a local congregation in 1 Corinthians 14, 34. And so from these various uses of the word church in the New Testament, the most important fact that stands out is this. In the universal sense, there is only one church. And accordingly, Paul said, there is one body in Ephesians 4, 4. The body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The congregations mentioned in the New Testament were local congregations of Jesus' one church. They were not denominations. They were all alike in doctrine and practice. And Paul wrote, you might remember, in 1 Corinthians 1, 10, Now I exhort you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. He emphasized that the church is to be united in doctrine by teaching that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. First century congregations worshiped alike. Denominations don't worship alike. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34, and 16, 1 and 2. And they were organized in the same way in Acts 14, 23. They taught the same doctrine in Acts 15. And any that taught differently were guilty of teaching false doctrine in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Now, how could all of today's denominations be part of the one universal church when they 
are so unlike in many doctrines and practices. In fact, some denominations teach doctrines that are exact opposites of other denominations. The fourth lesson is that Christ is closely related to his church. The New Testament describes a special relationship between Christ and his church. Christ built the church. He told his apostles, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. Christ owns the church. He spoke of it as my church. Individual congregations belong to him. They are literally churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16. Christ bought the church with his own blood. So he built it. He owns it. He bought it. Paul, in speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus, referred to the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. Christ is the savior of the church, the savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church, and the church is his body. God gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And then in 5.23 in Ephesians, Paul said, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. Then we learn that Christ loves the church. We read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In Ephesians 5.25, Christ died for the church, sanctifying, cleansing its members. He was crucified so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, Ephesians 5.26. You'll notice that the, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians is key in our discussion about what the church is. Since Christ is so closely related to his church, I think it's worthy of our love and respect. Anyone today who belittles the church is speaking against the body Christ loves, for which he died, and which he saves. There are some, though, that say, give me Christ, but not the church. They fail to realize that the church is a vital part of Christ's very being and God's plan. We should have the same attitude toward the church that Jesus had. We ought to love the church and, if necessary, be willing to suffer and die for the church. The church is the people of God. When Saul was on the way to Damascus to persecute the church, Christ appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who was he persecuting? The church. When Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? Jesus answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That's Acts 9, 4 and 5. By persecuting the church, Saul was persecuting Christ. Christ identified himself with the church. You could even say he identified himself as the church. This is me. This is also me. And in the spiritual realm, Christ is the head of the church. The church is part of him. And so the person who degrades the church is degrading Christ. Anyone who neglects the church is neglecting Christ. And the one who abandons the church is abandoning Christ. On the other hand, the Christian who respects the church and loves the church and serves the church is offering respect and love and service to Christ. A person's attitude toward Christ is evident in his attitude toward the church. The fifth point is that salvation is in the one church that Jesus built. The church does not save. The church is the saved. On the day of Pentecost, people who heard Peter preach Christ asked what they had to do to be saved in Acts 2 verse 37. And Peter told them to repent and be baptized to have their sins forgiven in Acts 2 38. Those who accepted what he had to say 
were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, Acts 2.41. And so the church had its beginning. In Acts 2, it concludes by saying that these Christians were constantly praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Verse 47. The saved were added to the church. Consequently, those who were saved were in the church, Christ's body, of which he is the Savior. Ephesians 5.23 But underline this, the church does not save. The saved are the church. When a person is saved, the Lord adds him or her to the church. In that, verse 47. And so no one in his church is without salvation. And everyone who has obtained salvation by obeying the gospel has been added to his church. Now remember, the church is not the building. <laughs> the church is the people. Just because you're inside a building doesn't mean you're inside the church, even though it may be used uh, as a place of worship. People don't decide who gets into the Lord's church. The Lord makes that decision. And he told us what the requirements were, and we've already mentioned those. The Bible teaches that the church is important. If you want to be saved, you must be in that church. You will be the church that Jesus owns. Now, how can you be sure that you're in the church that Jesus loved and died to save? Find a church that's like the New Testament church. Find a congregation that worships as the first century church did, is organized as that church was, and teaches the same doctrine that it taught. And once you've found such a church, how can you become a member of it? Well, do what people in the New Testament did to be saved. Do what the 3,000 did on the day of Pentecost. They listened with open hearts. They believed what Peter said about Jesus. Peter had said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, Acts 2.36. They were willing to confess that faith in Romans 10.10 10 and Matthew 10.32. They eagerly obeyed Peter's command. Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And then we read, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls, Acts 2.47. You can do the same wherever you are in the world. Recognize that you're a sinner and determine not to continue in sin. Be baptized, immersed in water, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will be forgiven by the Lord and added to His church. That's not my words. That's not my opinion. That's Acts 2, 47 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13. When you're baptized, you're saved. Really? Yes. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And become a member of the church which He saves. And then we can say, as Paul said in Ephesians 3.21, To him, to Christ, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening and participating in this devotion today. And I hope it's been beneficial and uplifting to you. Amen.